the problem of the governance of science has to do with the fact that science as we normally understand it uh, is an authoritative form of knowledge uh, and it gains that kind of authority from having been produced by what we regard as the best, best methods available to produce knowledge. Uh, and this tr typically involves extensive training uh, and it typically involves uh, not just training in methods, uh, but also in terms of understanding the past of how knowledge has been produced and so forth. And so at the end of the day, this is a matter that in the first instance is really the, the property, you might say, of an elite group of people. The people who are able to go to university, who are able to study, and so forth. And so while knowledge may be valid in terms of pro, uh, uh, providing a kind of reliable guide to how we should conduct our lives in the world and so forth, nevertheless, uh, there is an issue of accountability that remains open. Uh, and that is to say, who should have a say in terms of how this kind of knowledge called science ought to be taken forward. Now this wouldn't be so much of a problem if science wasn't making claims to be a universal form of knowledge, right? So when we, talk, when we think about science, we're often thinking about things like physics and Newtonian mechanics and Einstein and, and Darwin maybe. Uh, in other words, forms of knowledge that apply to everything at all places at all times regardless of who you are, right? So there's a sense in which knowledge is seen as the ultimate authority beyond any political authority, maybe even beyond theological authority, okay? And so the, the question becomes, if we are producing this kind of knowledge called science, to whom should that be accountable? And in the first instance, of course, science is accountable to the people producing it, okay? And this is what we call the peer review process. Uh, and peer review uh, is an idea that has to do with the uh, fact that knowledge may come from many different places, may, people may be doing different kinds of investigations, inquiries, and so forth. But there's going to be a point at which all of those people are going to have to go to some place and make tho those claims public make a public argument, explain them, and persuade people who have not actually had direct contact with the original material. And this is what peer review is about. Uh, and so academics are very familiar with this process, right? whereby you've done some research, you've spent a lot of time by yourself or whatever, and then you suddenly write it up and you send it somewhere to a journal and then there's a question about how do the people who read this accept what you've written as valid knowledge? That's the issue. And that's the peer review process. And this involves a, a large degree of trust because, in a sense, the people reading your stuff and who, the people who have to decide whether what you're, what you're saying is true will not have had first hand experience of what you're talking about. They have to trust you. Okay? This is an issue. Now, because in science there is all of this stuff called methodology, which, whereby you have to lay very clearly on paper what it is that you've actually done before you've got to the point where you're producing knowledge, this provides a kind of uh, check, you might say, a kind of promissory note with regard to trust, right? Because you've done something that, in a sense, they can say, oh, okay, you followed the rules, you've done the right thing, you've done this, that, the other thing, and so therefore we should trust you, we should publish your stuff, and once your stuff is published, then it becomes science, right? Because science is the stuff that the scientific journals publish at the end of the day. Nothing else counts as science unless it goes through this process. Now that's the first sense in which one can talk about a governance of science. Okay? Uh, 
That is the normal sense in which scientists think about the governance of science. Namely, it's something that is enforced and imposed by other scientists. Now, what does this mean uh, as a result? Uh, it could well mean that uh, everything's okay, but it also could mean that science is just this kind of self-serving, self-selective kind of activity. And this is kind of the problem, because at the end of the day, um, science isn't simply what the scientists themselves agree upon, but science at least claims to have a kind of universal validation. In other words, beyond just either the people who produce the knowledge, you know, firsthand, and even beyond the people who agree that the knowledge is valid, right? So there's this initial, additional kind of level at which science is valid. And so then the question becomes, how does that get established? How does the peer review process translate into some sense of scientific validation that is greater than just what the scientific community claims for itself? This is the real problem of the governance of science as far as I'm concerned. And so you might say there are two different ways of dealing with this matter. Uh, and I've been writing about this for a long time. I have a book on the governance of science that came out nearly 20 years ago. Um, but I think there are two general ways. One way is to say that we sort of treat the production of knowledge through science as a kind of external thing. You know, in other words, that uh, scientists do their thing, right? They do it individually, and then through the journal peer review process, they agree on something, and then everybody else kind of agrees to that once the scientists themselves have agreed, right? So you have a kind of chain of command, as it were where you start with the individual scientists doing the first-hand research, then it gets to the journals, which provides us another kind of validation, and then the, and then the, the, the general public just agrees to whatever the scientific community in this collective sense has agreed upon. And I think a lot of scientists like this idea, okay? Um, and I think it's also very convenient from the standpoint of policymakers in a certain way, because what it does is it creates a very clear divide between what the scientist does, right? So the scientists have agreed to this, so it must be true. And so the policymakers, in a way, have a kind of excuse in case they start to use the knowledge of these scientists and it goes wrong. Right? So the idea here is if the public or the policymakers actually accept the scientific knowledge that has already been agreed upon by the scientific community, then if it turns out that this knowledge doesn't do what people expected it to do, then you can say, well, the science was bad. The scientists agreed on it, but they were wrong. And the policymakers are okay because the policymakers trusted the scientists, you see? And as long as there's this bond of trust between the policymakers and the scientists that's based on a very clear sense of governance, namely the scientists govern themselves, but then once the scientists say something, the, the policymakers can do what they want with that, right? If there's this clear divide, then if things go wrong, right, the scientists maybe have done something wrong, okay? It's easy to give that kind of excuse. Why? Because the scientists themselves are not actually involved in the policy making. They draw a line. And as soon as the scientists draw a line as to the governance of science, and they just say, okay, we've figured out what's true, and now it's up to policymakers to do what they want, they have, in a way, absented themselves. They've made themselves absent from any further political discussion.
And so this is why there's a kind of different sense of governance of science that I'm talking about. And that's one in which the scientific process itself brings in more and more of the public into its production. In other words, it becomes harder and harder to distinguish the public from the scientists because the people are being brought. Now, there are lots of ways to do this. Now, one way, which is in fact what has happened historically, is that science itself has increasingly brought in people from backgrounds, economically disadvantaged, women, minorities, all of these kinds of people who previously have not been involved in the production of scientific knowledge are now part of it, right? They are now part of it in its first order way and its second order way. And what that means is that there's a sense in which the scientific community is becoming more and more representative of the larger society that science would feed into. Okay? And that then starts to reduce the distinction between science and the larger society. Okay? So it becomes harder then for policymakers to say, well, this is just what scientists think, and they got it wrong, and we're doing something else. But rather, if more and more of society is actually involved in the production of scientific knowledge, then it becomes harder and harder for politicians and policymakers to draw a line between science and the rest of society. So from my standpoint, the way in which we should be promoting the governance of science in the future is actually to get more and more people involved in the production of science itself. Okay? Uh, and I think once we do that and we have a fully democratized science enterprise where people feel that science isn't different from them, then I think we will get a kind of, you know, properly sort of organized sense of what I believe the governance of science should be.